Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Mark Guarino and I'm your moderator for today's webinar, Creating Safe Decisions, a Case Study on Human Performance Reliability. We are joined by two safety industry veterans, David Musgrave and Mike Mangan. And before I hand it over to them to introduce themselves, I will quickly cover some ground rules. The webinar will be in listen only mode uh, and we'd love to hear from you. So please enter any questions directly to me that come up in the chat box. And if we don't get to your questions then, David and Mike have graciously offered to stay on for a, a few extra minutes to answer your questions post webinar. webinar. So without further delay, I will now hand it over to uh, both uh, David and Mike to introduce themselves. Thanks, Mark. Uh, this is Mike Mangan. I'm the uh, head of solution development at DACRA Organizational Safety and Reliability. David? Hello all, welcome. Thanks for coming to the webinar. I'm David Musgrave. I look after our uh, DACRA's human performance uh, offerings. Uh, and yeah, thanks for coming. Looking forward to talking today uh, through our content. Great. Uh, so over the last couple of years, we've done a number of these types of webinars talking about uh, brain-centered hazards and the impact that those can have on our susceptibility for incidents and errors, as well as the defenses we can put in place to, to protect us. For, for today, what we thought would be interesting and helpful is to uh, talk about those topics within the context of real life scenarios and situations. And so we're gonna, we're gonna bring up different cases and situations um, and talk through how these brain center hazards might have an impact on the situation that's in front of us. Now, uh, just as a caveat, the people and the organization that, that we talk about is fictitious. However, the situations are real life. They are drawn from our experiences working with clients and organizations across multiple industries. So let's begin first by doing a little bit of a refresher about what human performance reliability is. So I think it's safe to say that uh, we're all human and we've all made mistakes. Um, we're, that's not gonna be a poll question. <laughs> Um, I think it's also safe to say that for an individual job or an individual task, we've all had the experience of doing that job or that task perfectly, to standard. And that's what we mean by human performance reliability. What are the types of situations and factors that make it more likely that we'll be able to do that job that's in front of us today or that task that's in front of us today up to standard? And what are the factors that limit us, that make it less likely that we'll be able to do it uh, perfectly. Yeah, it's interesting that comment on the bottom of the slide that our mistakes are unremarkable. Uh, most of the time, you know, we really get away unscathed and we get something wrong. Um, as Mike said, we, we, we all um, you know, regularly get things wrong. What we'll talk about here today is really you know, how do we avoid uh, critical errors uh, and sort of how to, what's the brain's role um, in uh, allowing those to happen, and what can we do about that as well? What you'll see here uh, on the slide, this may be new to you, maybe it's not, uh, is what we like to call, affectionately like to call, the seven uh, brain-centered hazards. So the, the seven brain-centered hazards that you see listed on the slide here, they're essentially the seven ways uh, that we get it wrong as human beings. So all human beings have this going, for, uh, going on for them. Um, for us, and uh, they're essentially precursors to human performance error. And so what we thought we'd do is uh, sort of a brief refresher since we'll be talking about how these impact um, within a couple of scenarios that we'll walk through in a little while. Uh, and uh, you know, what, what do these mean for you back at your uh, work sites as well? So let's review these. So the first one on the top left there, the fast brain functioning, it's the first one on the list uh, really because uh, this one gets a lot of people um, into trouble. Uh, fast brain functioning really all about us operating from habits and habits are a great thing you've, you've probably operated from several habits today um, already um, you know getting ready in the morning things like that. Um, that that's a great use of habits but fast brain functioning the reason it's made it onto our, our list of seven here that needs some management is really because the brain uh, can be quite lazy and will allow us to just operate from ha habits not think uh, think us through situations when we're planning our work, when we're doing our work, uh, and as well when we're with our families. Uh, we're, we're just zoned out, we're not paying attention. And so uh, based on the work that we do, 
having a look kind of in the rear view mirror at incidents as well uh, that our clients have had, many, many incidents have fast brain functioning as a contributing cause uh, as well. So we like to talk about, okay, what do we, what can we do about this um, internal hazard, this brain centered hazard, um, and, and we'll see how that, that can apply in real life work situations um, in a little while. Uh, the next on the list is visual recognition. So human beings have a massive amount of, the, of their brains, uh, of our brains de dedicated to um, vision. So lots and lots of neural real estate, the whole back part of your brain dedicated to vision. And so we have capability to see a lot more than we do, is what we know. And so again, the brain is a little bit lazy, doesn't like to uh, turn up the volume on our um, visual recognition fully. We've got to do that for ourselves. And so it's made the list here as a hazard, uh, really because um, we often don't see things uh, right in front of us. We often say um, seeing is suspect, uh, missing things right in front of us. Often people driving, as an example, driving a uh, fork truck uh, and may you know drive right into a painted yellow ballard that's been there for years. And, and the first thing that people will say often is, I didn't see it. I, di I didn't notice that. Uh, and those people aren't, aren't making that up. Uh, that's literally what happened. Uh, we didn't see what was right in front of us. So again, what can we do about it? We talk more about it. Uh, the third on the list, there's divided attention. It is what you think it is. Uh, it is uh, to do with multitasking um, and distraction as well. So when we are kind of juggling, trying to pay attention to multiple things uh, at one time, trying to think about multiple things at one time, uh, what we know is we're not very good at that and our rate of error goes up considerably the more things uh, that we're having a look on to think about. Uh, I was recently uh, in a plant and the operators that were in the control room were sitting in front of about 26 monitors um, that you know one person uh, is responsible to have uh, kind of control over. Uh, that person will feel real confident that they're going to notice any anomalies that may come up while they look at those monitors. But the science will tell us that that's not the case. You're very likely to miss things when uh, you're sort of cognitively overloaded um, and uh, allowing the divided attention hazard uh, to um, increase for, uh, risk for error. Uh, top of the list on the other side, their memory. I don't know how your memory is. Mine is not as good as it used to be as I get more gray hair every year. Uh, so memory, we often over rely on our memory. Uh, and, and believe, you know, oh, I'll remember to do that. Um, or maybe uh, I'm walking through a series of steps within a, a task, really important task, and I will take a pause at some point within those steps uh, to you know, take a lunch break or do something else. And I will then come back to the task and they'll believe I have completed the previous steps completely, but I have not. Um, so again, brain can be a little bit tricky. If it, 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 When we rely on memory, we make mistakes. Another piece to do with memory is also really related to training. Uh, all of us, every, everybody on this web, uh, web call uh, will have gone through and, and will continue to go through lots and lots of training uh, as we kind of upgrade our skills. But there's a good question. What actually sunk in uh, to our memories? What did we actually retain? Um, and, and we really know. And so this is where memory can be an issue as well when people are executing job tasks. Um, we often misremember. Next on the list is social think, uh, probably one of the least known of the uh, brain centered hazards. You may know lots about it, uh, but the social think hazards, really when people are working um, sometimes in teams, working together, uh, or uh, even when you're working solo, the social think hazards related to what we would call the social brain, it's actual part of your brain, runs across the, the top surface of your brain, kind of like a set of earmuffs from one ear uh, to the other outer surface right across your cortex. Uh, and this, this part of your brain, your social brain, is meant to have you uh, get on with other people, kind of stay with the tour, stay with the herd, don't make any sudden movements, kind of, so to speak. Uh, and it's served as well. That's why there's so many of us all around the planet uh, and, and we dominate. So it, it's, it serves its purpose, but it does get in the way of safety uh, because it does say, mm, you know, don't say anything that might cause trouble uh, with your colleagues. Uh, even when it comes uh, to uh, safety performance. So uh, when we ask people to speak up, you know, in disagreement, if you see something uh, that could be made safer, we're actually asking people to fight against their biology a little bit there. So we can say more about the social think uh, for sure. It's, it, it's quite a, uh, a, 
a massive hazard in businesses today um, that would lead people not to speak up, intervene, and also communicate with their, with their colleagues uh, about important matters. Second to last on the list is fatigue. Fatigue, we can spend the whole day talking about fatigue uh, because it is a massive hazard. Uh, it's, it, put simply, we've not got enough high quality sufficient sleep uh, in the last 24 hours uh, and also in the last seven days um, cumulatively. Um, what we are uh, susceptible to this particular hazard. What does fatigue do? Really has our slow brain not be recharged. It's, it's really not operating the way it's meant to. So our slow brain right up the front of our, uh, fr the front of our brain above our eyebrows. It's the smartest part of the brain. It's the opposite to the fast brain. Uh, it, our slow brain is our thinking brain. If our thinking brain's not recharged because we're fatigued, we're really left with our fast brain uh, to uh, get us through some tasks. Uh, it also has implications uh, with the visual recognition as well. We, we don't tend to notice things um, that are happening all around us. Uh, we've all been in this situation before. I know we've all been in a fatigued state. Uh, so it, uh, it has made it to the list of seven, uh, given the impacts it has in business um, in terms of safety. Last but not least is stress and urgency. So when we are under the pump, whether somebody's made us feel that way, as we sometimes say, um, or we've just really put pressure on ourselves. We've perceived that um, we don't have the resources within ourselves to complete this task in front of us. Uh, and we feel um, some unhelpful stress, some unhelpful urgency. Um, what we talk about is you know, how, how do employees uh, and leaders go uh, being sensitive to that this particular hazard is uh, upon us because of the nature of the work today? Uh, and uh, what do we do about it in the moment once we notice it as well? So that is a very quick tour through the seven brain-centered hazards. Thank you very much, David. And that's a that's a great uh, refresher of those seven. I'm going to continue to use that word, uh, that phrase, under the pump. I've never heard that until today, but I like it a lot. It's so descriptive. Uh, so let's set the scene for you. Um, we're going to put you in the place of an aluminum fabrication plant, and we're going to be focusing predominantly on the maintenance mechanic team at this plant. And so the way this team operates, they, every morning they meet and uh, the maintenance manager uh, provides them with job assignments at the pre-job brief. And the, the work that they're typically assigned is both a, a mix of preventative and unplanned maintenance. They are typically working in two-person teams. However, they can often be signed to go out uh, working solo. The typical shift is a 10-hour day. Uh, and they do rotate through on-call types of responsibilities. And depending on how well the plant is operating, will be um, or can be called off uh, routinely uh, for off-hours emergencies. Uh, the reporting boss, as I said, was a maintenance manager, but they often, as is the case for many maintenance uh, uh, mechanics, they tend to work very closely with the operations shift supervisors. Okay, so let's meet the team. Now, the team is much larger than these three folks, but these are the three folks that we're going to be meeting in, uh, directly and working through the situations that they've uh, got on their plate today. So the first person is Joe. Joe is a 30-year employee, all at the same site. And throughout those 30 years, he has become an expert in the site's uh, power and pump systems. Uh, he's married for 35 years and has two children and three grandchildren. Tanya is a nine-year employee. In addition to the maintenance mechanic duties that she has, similar to everyone else, she's also responsible for the installation of the new machine guarding system that they're putting in place. Now, th not just at this site, but across the, the company. So she's been to a number of other sites installing this machine guarding and uh, today, as we'll see in one of the scenarios, she's installing this um, in the, her current site. And Tanya is the single mother of a three-year-old son. Last is Michael. He's 18 years in the industry, um, but just three years at this particular aluminum fabrication site. His primary experience has been in chemical polyethylene manufacturing, uh, and Michael is engaged to be married. So now that we know the team and the work that they do and the types of job assignments they get, let's talk through the first scenario. 
So in this first situation, um, Joe is locking out the A-line pump's power supply to conduct some preventive maintenance, a routine task he's done numerous times over his 35 years. He's cut the power and is, was ready to attach his lock when he was called away to handle a fabrication machine that overheated. Now, overheated machines pose a significant fire risk, so acting quickly is very important to them. Uh, Joe's got a tremendous amount of experience dealing with the overheaded uh, machine, so he's typically the first one that they call to do that when that's uh, when there's an issue like that because he, he's an expert at handling those. So he goes out and he handles that overheated machine, and while he's walking back to his his preventive maintenance job at the pump, he gets a call from HR uh, saying that his wife had called and that Joe's mom was complaining of shortness of breath and has been taken to the hospital. No word yet on Joe's mom. So Joe comes back to the pump and he's ready to continue the, the project that he had, the preventive maintenance work. And he's ready to bleed the system, but he hasn't realized that someone had turned the power supply back on. So we're at that point right before a potential error occurs. So at this point, the question to you is, what are the brain center hazards you think that might be playing a role in this particular scenario? Okay, so we're, um, so now we're at the poll and, um, you can see the selections there, fast brain functioning, memory, divided attention, stress and urgency, and visual recognition. Uh, and I'll take this moment to also remind people that sending your questions uh, that we can ask uh, David and Mike throughout the uh, webinar, and we have a result. Um, so 86% say divided attention, 56 uh the second is 72 percent say stress and urgency so divided attention and stress and urgency are the top two followed by 56 percent say fast brain functioning and then we have 35 percent have chosen memory and third another third okay uh, Mark, you were breaking up there a little bit. Um, I didn't quite hear that last one, but maybe, maybe David, you would have heard that. Uh, the last, last one was, yeah, the last is visual recognition at 28%. Okay. Yeah, so lots of uh, votes for a divided attention in particular, uh, and also for uh, stress and urgency as well uh, in particular and some and some for the other ones as well fast brain function made a made a good showing here as well but back <laughs> over to you <Mike. laughs> okay um so are we are we looking at the screens again we are okay good thank you uh, yeah so interesting results and what one of the things that comes out as we start to make this discussion is that um, a lot of these brain-centered hazards can impact each other so absolutely i think uh, divided attention is um it is a significant significant contributing factor here uh, one of the things with divided attention with distractions is that um this also has a significant impact on our memory. So if we're, particularly when we are doing procedures that we've done routinely over multiple times throughout the years, where we don't really necessarily, we don't feel like we need a set of procedures in front of us, we know how to work the steps. When we are doing that set of procedures and we get pulled away, we get distracted, we get moved to another task, that tends to have an impact on us when we come back because we don't often remember where we were in that procedure, in that set of procedures. Was I on step four? Was I on step five? Um, and we tend to be confident in that memory. So I think both of those things tend to have an impact on each other, um, particularly in this, in this case with Joe. Um, the other piece too, and I think this relates to the fast brain functioning, as, as many of you noted, the stress and urgency are playing a role. And it's interesting in this case because 
the the sources there are multiple sources of stress and urgency in this case so there's certainly the urgency to handle the emergency with the uh, overheating fabrication machine uh, but then there's also the stress that comes from the uh, the other uh, the the call about Joe's mom so which also fuels the distraction and divided attention that adds to his uh, distraction um, and certainly adds to his stress as well. Uh, but the other piece around this, as David mentioned, as he was talking through the brain-centered hazards, is that stress and urgency have an impact on limiting our ability to concentrate and to focus. Um, and divided attention and distractions can have that impact as well. And so as a result of that, we can tend to be a little bit more in that fast brain functioning mode and less able to, to fully concentrate, fully engage our, our slow brain on, on that particular uh, topic. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, visual recognition can also play a role in here where he doesn't, he may have walked by the place where, um, where you turn the power supply on and off and simply not noticed that, um, that it would it had been re-engaged um, so that certainly is the case hard to know for sure with some of these incidents exactly all of the things that are could have played a role in that so the question now is okay so what kinds of defenses and countermeasures can we put in place to help minimize the chance that this will have an impact on us yeah, absolutely uh, it, it really is it's a good question so it's one thing to sort of notice what, what you know what's going on here uh, it's it's another um, sort of identify what you know what what can we do about it what are we doing about it and is it working uh, as well so we'll we'll show you a few things that will pop up here on the slide um, specific to uh, what we can do so when we look at uh, things like uh, brain aligned uh, procedures so we do a lot of work right you know with folks to help with uh, procedures being more reliable uh, in particular and, and so. Uh, is it easy in a particular critical procedure? Uh, so we have to get this work right. Um, and as we go through the steps, is it is it designed in a way, the procedure designed in a way that would have us um, not make errors uh, as we go through? So are there prompts, uh, the design of the procedures, the look and feel of them? Um, how are those created in a way that reduces the likelihood uh, that we'll make uh, errors, you know, lose our place along the way, uh, vague, vague language uh, that can be confusing to people, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So things that fit into that bucket uh, from the world of procedures, you know, things that we can do in that regard uh, to make that stronger, uh, to help employees get it right more often. Um, also, human performance reliability culture. So uh, all of us on this call talk a lot about culture uh, and making sure that we've got a culture that values safety. Uh, we also want to have a look at, so how do we go uh, really valuing reliability uh, as well and, and, and making sure that we, we get the, the big stuff right over and over and over, year on year on year. Uh, a lot of companies can have sort of a, a banner year from a safety perspective, but what about having you know, really every year uh, be safe and reliable uh, with, with business targets being hit, whether it's quality, uh, meeting customer demands, uh, and also safety as well. That's where the reliability culture piece comes in. And what are we doing to, to, to foster that? Bottom of the list there, you'll see on the left-hand side, uh, brain-aligned leadership messaging. You may not have heard that, uh, heard of that one before. So when we talk about leadership communication, uh, there's no shortage of folks talking about leadership uh, communication uh, likely within your business. Uh, brain-aligned leadership messaging is really about, uh, so what are we doing in particular um, as, as a group of leaders uh, to uh, understand how our words sort of resonate with people. So whether that's words in an email, whether that's words as we greet a group, greet a group of people, um, or in a video like this, um, what's actually going on uh, based on what we're saying um, and how we're standing, what it looks like, all that sort of thing. Um, you know, what we have found is a lot of leaders um, really appreciate knowing how to get messages to stick uh, that really have people um, be less likely to be susceptible to divided attention, fast brain functioning, um, uh, and also relying on memory uh, as well. And instead, they check the procedures, um, give them what they know about memory. So, yeah, it's an important it's an important one to uh, have a look as leaders. What are we saying? What are we doing? How does that resonate with people? Uh, top of the other side there of the slide, uh, right first time execution techniques. 
Yeah. So everybody wants to get things right, you know, done right the first time. Uh, but what are we putting in place uh, really to help people be more likely um, to have correct performance? Uh, it was sort of, sort of within the safety management system. What can be done? Yeah. So putting some things in place that help people along uh, to get things right more often. Yeah. Not major change, just some uh, things sort of inserted within the work processes and the flow of the work. Make sure that people um, are sort of thinking through the things they need to think through. Uh, stress and distraction management strategies. Yeah, so what do we do about those? We will never get rid of the stressors. We would never get rid of all the distractors. It won't happen um, because they keep coming at us. We're often required to do more with less You know, every year. Um, things get leaner and leaner. Um, and so what are we putting in place to sort of um, counteract that uh, from, from a stress and distraction uh, strategy and sort of who's on top of that to make sure that we're addressing uh, that end of it. Uh, more broadly, uh, education and awareness on brain-centered hazards. So when we, uh, some, some of the content that we had talked through the, the list of seven, so to speak, uh, that I had uh, walked through earlier, uh, having a good level set uh, within a business about the brain-centered hazards and the, and the exposure that that brings to the business and all the folks that work there, um, really important to get everybody on the same page that it's not just the physical hazards um, you know, that, that, that will get us. Um, we're often ready for those, but are we sort of brain ready uh, to be able to uh, address the hazards that are kind of within us um, along the way? So these are some things to think about in terms of defenses and countermeasures. I don't know if you have other things to add as well, Mike. Oh, I, uh, I think you're absolutely right, um, David. The, uh, one of the things in that stress and distraction management strategy, uh, you kind of hit on one uh, directly where, you know, just knowledge of I'm under stress or I'm being distracted in conjunction with understanding how that has an impact on my error. Bringing that into your consciousness, bringing that into your slow brain has a, a well regarded uh, in the research effect on your ability to manage those things. So uh, those two things together uh, often work well in terms of helping to, to mitigate the, the negative effects of stress and distraction. No, that's a really good point. I was in I was in the plan uh, setting not too long ago. Oh, you got a question, Mark? Uh, yeah, we actually have a question coming in, and I thought I'd just drop it into both of you to see. It's coming in from Benjamin Martin, and he's asking: Is social think the same thing as group think? Are we talking about deferred responsibility and the bystander effect? Yeah. So there's lots of things. I'm happy to answer. Uh, so there, there's lots of things that sort of fit within. Uh, the social think hazard. So definitely group think is part of that. Um, uh, how many meetings have folks sat in where people sit, sit silent and say nothing when everybody's thinking, you know, what's been, what's been suggested in the meeting or conveyed is um, not what everybody thinks should occur, whether it's to do with safety or not, but yet no one speaks up and says anything. Um, people sort of just go along to get along. Um, so yeah, definitely group think uh, part of that. Uh, bystander effect as well uh, would link in under that category. Um, as well, um, and then we would go we would go further as well, and and speak about things like, uh, you know, Mike and I work together a lot um, and, and and get on well, and so if we were working on a project together, whether it's safety related or not, um, it's it's less likely that we would um, communicate really thoroughly uh, with each other because you know what, you know, I know what you're going to say, you know what I'm going to say. We work together a lot. Um, and so the brain just gets a little bit lazy and will have us kind of under communicate with the people that we work best with. Um, for all the people um, that, you know, work well together, uh, I've seen many incident reports, you know, that sound like, you know, Joe slammed his finger in, you know, the, the back of a dump truck door um, while he was working with so-and-so and, -so. and uh, just under communication. Uh, and it's a shame when it happens, but we know it's going to happen. So we might as well do more. Um, to, to call it out, um, especially with work teams that they just get on so well, um, they work together kind of hand in glove. There's risk that comes with that that we should talk about uh, and, and be a little bit more uh, precise about the communication that we're going to have in a given day, especially for the critical tasks where we can't afford to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Good. That's a good question. Uh, and so uh, as we jump into situation number two here with Tanya. Um, 
uh, and talk about uh, some work that she's doing with regards to machine guarding. You'll see here, uh, Tanya is installing a new machine guarding system on fabrication machine number three. She told people uh, she's done this so often that she could do almost do with her eyes closed. She's been on the clock for 14 hours uh, because she was called out at 3 a.m. to handle an emergency. Uh, however, she doesn't notice that the guarding is improperly seated and is in danger of falling off. And she's just about to power on the system uh, for some testing here. So that's the scenario. We're curious to get your thoughts on what's going on here from a brain-centered hazard point of view. So if you can let us know, we've given a few options here, listed out a couple. Yep, um, so the question here, what brain-centered hazards are impacting the work? And so please uh, participate in our poll and uh, the, your choices are fast brain functioning, fatigue, social think, memory, and visual recognition. And we have some questions coming in as well too, so that's good. We'll give them maybe one or that's great okay, so now we, we have we have the results. Um, boy, the overwhelming result at 92% is fatigue. And then uh, the three that follow that are about 60 to 67%. That's fast brain functioning, memory, visual recognition. And at the very bottom, almost no people uh, chose this one at 3% is social think. So the top one is fatigue at 92%. Okay. Well, that's great to see that. Thank you for voting. Obviously, fatigue, 92%. Yeah. So that, that's the one that really sticks out here, isn't it, um, in particular? So imagine that, you know, Tanya is asleep. She's gotten a phone call. She's gotten called in. So what we know is that her sleep has been interrupted. So not only did she probably not get enough sleep, um, it, as we can read between the lines here, um, her delta wave sleep, so her restorative sleep that happens um, particularly near the end of her sleep, perhaps throughout the sleep cycle, but particularly the, at the end of her sleep, she's likely had that interrupted. And so if she's not sort of recharged the cell phone, um, that is the slow brain, you know, she, so that's not happened for her. Uh, so obviously we've listed fatigue here, you've identified that one as well. Uh, we've also listed out here fast brain functioning. Uh, for obvious reasons and also related to fatigue. So um, when we're fatigued, we're much more likely to be operating from fast brain and not notice things. Uh, but about 50% of the time anyway, we're not going to um, notice things that are happening all around us. We're just sort of walking through habitually uh, and, and, and not gonna notice really um, anything that's out of the ordinary. Fatigue just amplifies that you know, significantly. Um, let's not forget as well, uh, it sounds like tanya has got a full life. You know, she's got a little one, a three-year-old running around that she's got to take care of um, at home. So she's she's a busy person. Um, and so lots, lots going on at family, lots going on at work today uh, as well. And so uh, pretty easy to, to miss something here. You can see the ties into visual recognition, of course, as well. So even on a good day, we miss things in front of us. Uh, but when you uh, sort of add in uh, things like fatigue, um, and other elements that would have us um, be sort of pressed not to notice what's going on, um, we can get into trouble. So this is this is sort of what we see when we do um, analysis of incidents. Mike and I often will spend time analyzing, you know, a bunch of incidents or near misses that have happened for them within a, a client organization of ours, and we'll be able to pick out things like this and say, you know, which of this, which of the seven brain-centered hazards could be all of them. But which of the seven brain-centered hazards have really played a significant role um, in leading to this, um, th this particular uh, incident? Anything else to add as well, Mike? I didn't. Uh, I think you hit on very well how fatigue can have an impact on both visual recognition and fast brain functioning, um, as well as its own independent impact on it. So again, as we mentioned before, a lot of these are uh, interrelated, they have an impact on each other. Um, so, so the question becomes, what sort of defenses and countermeasures can we add to try to impact this? Well, 
um, one of the things, and when we when we talk to folks about the incidents and and uh, events, sometimes they'll they'll just say, uh, well, you know, they should have just been paying attention. Um, they should have been it, another way of saying they should have been engaging their slow brain thinking. And even when we talk to frontline workers about fast brain and slow brain, you know, they'll say things. Well, okay, we just need to engage our slow brain the whole day. Well, I don't know about you, but I think the chances that we'll be able to engage our slow brain for a 10 hour day 100 percent of the time are, are fairly low so the question is how do we what what's the right strategy for cueing slow brain thinking and one of the things that we'll talk to uh, frontline workers about is um, identifying those key spots in the job and the task in your day where it's appropriate to take a second step back and in the slow brain. And so in this particular example, as uh, Tanya was finishing her work on the, the guard, and but just before she powers up the, uh, resets the power, turns the power on, that's a perfect opportunity as you're transitioning from one part of the job to another to stop um, and get into slow brain. Mode. So there's there's um, there's an art to this recognizing that it's unlikely and uh, to, to and almost unrealistic to ask people to be in slow brain mode for 100 percent of their 10 hour day. Um, so helping them get smart about when to do that and putting in those cues is is really effective. Um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here because we have a question um, coming in. Uh, this is from Daniel Sherlock. And he's asking, can you give an example of something, quote, inserted into the workflow, end quote, that would be right first time execution? So back to the previous um, topic, Mark, is that? Um, so so when, when we talk about right first time execution strategies, uh, a lot of that is around, there, there are a few things around how you check the work as you're going, so typically breaking the work up and checking to ensure you're at standard as you go along. There are some pieces around how you remove distractions from the workplace. Um, there's also pieces around how you ensure that you are at standard as you go. Uh, the folks that tend to, to do that tend to, I, even though it seems like that would take a lot longer, the folks that do that tend to get more work done and or get work at a higher standard done more regularly. That's an example of a right first time execution strategy that we would, we would educate and, and uh, help people uh, deploy. Yeah, I would add, and I would add to that as well. Um, really also adding in what we would call sort of fast brain nudges. Um, so there's, there's lots of really good research around nudge theory. Um, uh, we, we love when we can get uh, sort of help people get into into slow brain thinking, but we don't want to also sort of leave um, the utility of the fast brain. So how can we have people sort of move toward or be prompted um, visually um, or, or via audio? What can be put in place to prompt the fast brain uh, to pick up on cues that it, you know it's time to do a check in, it's, it's time to move in this direction, this sort of thing. Uh, the most simple, the mo probably one of the most simple versions of a fast brain prompt is the little footprints that are often, you know, um, on the floor through plants that are just meant to guide people in the right direction. Uh, they're not meant for you to think about. They're just meant to be there to cue your brain. Hey, you might want to head this way um, as well. Uh, we do a lot of custom work that's specific to this. Um, things like the issues with a plant that was having people um, become overheated. Uh, in the summer months, air non-air conditioned plant. Uh, and so obviously many things you can do to, to combat heat. You can do some fun ones to sort of add into the mix as well. Um, you know, specific to if you increase the size of the cups at the drinking stations, uh, people are more likely to um, go ahead and drink more water. Um, sort of, it's not something they're thinking about, it just naturally happens. You can even measure how much water people are drinking if you want to, to actually quantify the, the increase. So there's fun things that you can do sort of nudge people um, kind of in the right direction from a fast brain perspective. Um, all of that said, um, things, you know, situations uh, like the situation with Tanya here, um, if, if a, you know, let's say a pump is not going to be seated properly, um, we would always suggest that there's a fail safe in place. So you literally can't power up the machinery if, the, if, if things aren't seated properly. 
Um, mm -hmm. This is the best way um, to keep people safe and well. So there's fail safes built in place. Um, you know, that goes without saying. Mm -hmm. um, so I have another question coming in. Um, this is from Edward Lido. He's saying, I used to work as a lineman and sometimes would work from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on trouble work. Around 2 a.m., we would all feel a second wind. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Well, how, can you, um, how can you describe? I guess the <laughs> question is, what what um, is a second wind a real thing? And um, is that, yeah. uh, uh, how would you describe a second wind in slow brain thinking? Well, it's uh, what what's often happening is uh, in a typical day we will our our bodies will go through cycles of alertness, um, and that typically happens with digestion, happens with body temperature, and which is why now, now my guess is that when you were working 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on trouble work. You were taking lunch probably at that, uh, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning or so. Um, so you've gotten through that post-lunch dip. But often, most folks, typically in an office, they're going to feel that post-lunch dip where they're heading. They've got a little bit of feeling a little bit groggy, a little bit uh, sluggish, and that's um, where their their body is spending the time on digesting food. Their body temperature lowers, and you're getting all the signals that it's time for a siesta and time for a little nap. Um, my guess is that the the as you were doing the lineman work, you were ahead of that, and you may have felt that a little bit earlier. And now you've just kind of come out of that, and it feels like it's a um, you know a second wind where you're re-energized. You're getting the energy from the food without the uh, the fatigue elements of it brought uh, brought into it. But you're right, you're, our bodies go through cycles throughout the day, for sure. But, uh, um, Dave, anything to add on to that? Yeah, uh, I, I suppose with regards to the cycles, I, yeah, I would say, um, you know, during a regular kind of day shift, obviously, we, be, we become less alert as, as the day goes along. I actually just did some research over in Australia about this. Um, that's just come through today. Um, it's sort of for giving further evidence that this is, um, you know, obviously the case um, and, and alive and well. Uh, when you're on, when you're working in the evening as well, uh, if you're working a night shift, let's say, uh, and you're you're sort of on a flip flop shift there, and so you know, as the night progresses, you know, once you get into that um, sort of two to five a.m. Um, stretch there, uh, your your risk does go up as you become uh, you sort of feel more fatigued. Uh, and as you sort of move through that, um, yeah, you can get what it feels like to be sort of a second wind um, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. That's a good question. So uh, kind of getting back with uh, or continuing with Tanya. So we've got some strategies we're engaging in around slow brain thinking. There's also some strategies around visual recognition. We, we don't naturally know how to look both broadly and deeply. And so even on our best days when we're fully alert, we may miss things that are in, uh, in, you know, right in front of us in our visual field. And so, we, you know, there are things you can teach to, and if you can get into those habits of how to look differently, you're more likely to pick up changes uh, and, and you're more likely to pick up that the uh, guard is not seated properly. The, the other piece, and this is in addition to what uh, David mentioned, David mentioned a great example where, you know, Outside of the individual things for Tanya, there are fail safes that you would try to build into the into the systems and products that make it so that there are alerts if you're if it's not seated pr properly or there are ways to address that uh, or uh, alert people to it ahead of time. Uh, but the last piece is fatigue mitigation defenses, and there's a there's a whole number of defenses that uh, go under this umbrella. Uh, so one of the things, if I'm the plant manager, I want to know I would like to know what kind of structural fatigue is there. In other words, are, are the way the shifts we have lined up or how we call people off shift, um, how we allocate overtime, do any of those policies or approaches we take make it more likely for the workforce or even just particular individuals? Because we all know there are a lot of folks that can be, you know, that take uh, the great proportion of overtime. Uh, 
is the workforce, even just some of those individuals, are they putting themselves at risk of uh, fatigue where uh, they might be a harm to themselves or to others from, from that standpoint? In addition, there's certainly a lot of education within the workforce uh, as well as leadership around how do you get good sleep? Uh, how, do you, how do you have good sleep hygiene? How do you make sure that when you are off and are ready for sleep that you're maximizing the quality of sleep that you get? Um, but then there's, a, there's another element of this, which is the, the culture, uh, creating an environment in which when, when everybody knows about the dangers of fatigue and everybody is aware that this is, you know, we want to, it takes a team, it takes a whole site to help counteract this, then we're more likely to have situations in which Tanya raises her hand and says, hey, you know, I'm on my 14th hour. Um, I'm worried about setting up this machine guard and brings that up to her supervisor. And then as a team, they can decide what's the right mitigation for that. Is it something where we've got the flexibility where we could schedule this for tomorrow morning where she's more alert? Or is this something where we're going to have a, give you an assistant, another pair of eyes to help uh, make sure things go well? Or, you know, we can we can shuffle the work in a way to help uh, counteract uh, the issues of fatigue. That's in very mature sites where they're, they've got uh, an appropriate way to deal with fatigue. So at this point, why don't we, why don't we go into the third one, uh, the third situation. This is uh, the whole team and uh, an unplanned problem. So Joe, Tanya, and Michael are working on a complicated unplanned problem with one of the fabrication machines. Joe's checking the diagnostic indicator. Michael is examining the punching section as Tanya checks the cutting operations. It's a critical machine and there's a heavy pressure to get it running because an important order from their biggest client is due to ship today. Joe concludes if they reset the settings and power it up, the problem will likely be fixed. He resets the settings and tells Michael he's going to power up the machine. He assumes Michael will relay the message to Tanya but Michael also assumes that Joe has already told her. So given that situation, similar to the other one, um, indicate on the, within the five options which brain-centered hazard or hazards you think is playing a role in this event. Okay, so for this poll, um, we are asking what brain-centered hazards are impacting the work, and you're choosing between divided attention, fatigue, social think, stress and urgency, and visual recognition. And I want to also let people know that please keep, in, keep on sending in your questions. We have a few more um, in the queue here. Okay, so here are the results. Um, overwhelmingly, the top choice was stress and urgency. By social think at 63%. 41% uh, chose divided attention. And a fifth, almost a fifth, 22% uh, chose visual recognition. And fatigue was at the bottom, the very bottom at 8%. So back to you for any insight on these. How much for stress and urgency, Mark? You kind of cut out there that, for a second. I'm sorry. That was 78%. That's the top choice. Okay. And 63% for social think as well. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I think uh, we hit on, from from our perspective, the, the two top ones, I think, that are having the most impact. But like we said before, that these both... Uh, th these impact each other. So these hazards have uh, a cascading effect on each other. David talked a little bit earlier about social think. And there are uh, a number of facets to this. One of the facets is that we want to be, we want to feel like we belong and are um, within our, our group or our tribe. And so we're reluctant to speak up if the consensus point of view is going in a different direction from what we're, our opinion is or what we think, uh, particularly if that consensus is from a more senior group. And in this situation, I think that's a little less likely, uh, even though my, uh, Joe is a more senior 
member of the team, I think it's a little less likely that this is playing a role. I think it's more of the other element that David had mentioned in that, you know, as humans, we have this wonderful ability to uh, put ourselves in the position of someone else and see the world from their perspective and even anticipate what they might do. Um, and we've been doing this since we were very young, since we were two or three years old. It's, it's amazing, this capability. However, we tend to, uh, once we do it often enough, we tend to make assumptions without even checking those assumptions. So what could be going on here from a social think standpoint is that, um, you know, Joe is assuming Michael is going to tell Tanya. Michael is assuming Joe has already told Tanya, and, but they never verbalize those assumptions. They never verbalize their mental models so that they can see that they've they've made a, uh, a mistake in their assumptions. Uh, so that's one of the elements that's happening there. And I think the other one, as, as um, most folks identified, is that uh, there's a stress and urgency. When we're under those stress and urgency processes or, or pressures, um, we tend to try to take uh, shortcuts. We, we're trying to go faster. We're trying to catch up. And so that makes it more likely that we'll go with the assumptions that we've got. Um, again, we're impacting that social think. I'm assuming that Michael told him, uh, we got to go. We got to get this back going. Um, and so those are some of the big um, pieces that are having an impact. And I, I think, you know, certainly divided attention and visual recognition could be playing a role in there as well in this scenario. Um, uh, but these, I think, are the two most significant uh, brain center hazards that are contributing. Um, I, I would give a vote to the, uh, to the about 40 percent of people voted as well for the fast brain. It's quite interesting mm -hmm. when you have a group of people like this working together, you know, 18 years of tenure, 30 years of tenure, nine years of tenure. Um, feels sort of psychologically safe to be with that group, you know, to be able to speak up and you know, everything seems to go into plan, everything's fine. Um, you really could see people slipping into fast brain because you know we're so good at this and we work so well together. Um, it is social think and action, but also people, you know, fast brain just sort of overtakes. Absolutely. Um, one of our uh, participants is chiming in, just commenting that it's Carol Setters, and she's commenting saying yet over 40% of fatal road accidents contain elements of fatigue. So not a question, but she just kind of wanted to add that comment. If you wanted to jump on that at all, absolutely. If you if you look if you if you dive into the research on fatigue, um, it's not only affecting road accidents. It's um, it, in some ways it's just pernicious across uh, the country and across the world. Uh, the um, the amount the number of folks that are chronically in fatigue states and uh and the impact that's having on accidents injuries driving problems etc it's yeah it's, it's, it's a significant threat. it is any really any time that your brain is in a fatigue state it's going to look for um opportunities really to recharge itself so you'll, you'll drop into a bit of a micro sleep um, potentially so that the brain can recharge itself um, if you've not gotten that sleep that you need and driving, what a perfect time to do that while you're driving a car is interesting. <laughs> the brain perceives these sort of um, very monotonous, very automatized tasks that you can seemingly do with your eyes closed. Driving is just one example that we all do. Um, your, your brain really will take it, take that as an opportunity to say, you know what, this car's got lots of airbags, seems to be pretty straightforward. Um, I'm just going to zone out here for a moment. Um, I'll be right back. And, and, and uh, <laughs> It's, right. it's really just based on our design. Yeah. Um, we also have a question coming in from uh, uh, Vyacheslav Kuzman, who's asking, are there any type of training in visual, are there any types of training in visual literacy from an occupational safety point of view that can improve visual recognition? Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Mike's actually going to talk about it in just a moment, um, in particular. But but we do we we, we certainly do a lot of uh, that work. Is uh, as Mike and I would uh, reference it, uh, really teaching people how to see um, fully um, and, and notice what's in the, the full um, spectrum uh, of their situation. So really focused on um, proactively creating great situational awareness. Um, that's that's some of our our favorite and I think most impactful work to do. Um, is, is really helping people um, really to, to be able to notice what's going on around them and kind of taking their full visual 
um, hardware, so to speak, for, for a test drive um, as much as possible. When you have a look in terms of defenses and countermeasures, so what can we do with regards um, that last example? Um, and these are things that, that are just great to do generally in, uh, in business. Um, really having a focus on um, creating some alignment around risk. Uh, what, does that, what does that mean? Really focused on uh, values-based decision-making. So when we have a look, uh, when things go wrong, um, uh, in particular, when there's sort of multiple things competing uh, for, for one's attention, that can also create what we would call a goal conflict. That is, I've got all these things sort of pulling on me um, and I'm not sure what to do. You know, I, I hear, you know, I hear messaging about safety being, you know, first and being most important, my personal safety. Um, but also I hear a lot about some other things that are really important as well. Um, and so when we're within a work task, um, human beings make a decision within about a quarter of a second. And most of those decisions are great. And, and we do get it right, given all the training and messaging that happens in business. But when it comes to critical decision making, uh, it really just takes but one um, decision to be incorrect. Um, uh, and, and we, of course, will place no blame on employees whatsoever. We look at the system and talk about what could we do to further have and further support um, employees and leaders uh, making values-based decisions, uh, correct decisions, uh, really for the, for the tough decisions. Yeah. There's interesting things going on as well with the U.S. Navy right now. The U.S. Navy has just um, signed on uh, with Harvard University to do very um, expansive work with regards to um, decision quality, so helping people on the front lines get things right more often. Um, so super interesting as, as the world takes notice um, and as industry really gets more into this. Uh, the next item on the list is uh, human performance reliability culture. We referenced it before, um, but again, really coming back to um, are we focused on um, getting things right um, consistently and, and really having that be our um, stance? It's in, uh, important to instill that within the culture. And so what things are in place to make sure that we're doing that? So we check some balances and also um, what languaging, what communication, what messaging is happening in the business that speaks specifically to reliability uh, and getting things right, um, the important things right all the time. Team communication uh, and intervention capabilities. So really focused here on how do we help people, um, first of all, kind of understand some of the things that we talked about already around, um, you know, we often under communicate with the people that we know best. Uh, and so knowing that is is important. And then, okay, so what will we do instead? How will we bake it into our work process that we we're actually going to over communicate to compensate? Um, you know, when it when it counts. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, I was in a team of sort of mixed group of folks, really senior leadership people, right down through the front lines, and you're on a table. Um, and the most senior folks were asking questions, um, and uh, no one was answering. Pretty obvious why nobody was answering, given the hierarchy. The person leading that meeting could have inoculated that meeting um, against uh, groupthink and other things that are happening there from a social brain perspective, and really gotten good team communication um, going. Um, so yeah, when you when you know more, you, you sort of do better. Uh, last on the list, stress, distraction, um, and managing uh, those strategies. Uh, again, we can teach people how to take a different route to get things these things right. Okay, I, I know we're we're just about out of time. So let me let me just talk a little bit about uh, you know our making safe decisions approach. So we we have we've talked about systems, we've talked about uh, organizational culture, what we can do from a leadership standpoint, those are all, you know, layers of defenses that we're putting in place to help drive human performance reliability. This last layer of defense is focused predominantly at that frontline worker level, and it's giving those individuals and teams some capabilities to help them uh, combat some of the things we talked about in these scenarios. So uh, you think about the worker that's all by themselves, alone and unafraid, two in the morning, doing their job, doing the best that they can. And uh, when they're working that job, they're going to be going through seeing, thinking, and doing, the three phases of human action. And in seeing, there are that's when that fast brain 
visual recognition brain center hazards can have an impact. Um, so understanding what those are and then learning specific strategies um, to look at the world a little bit differently. So when we talk about perception or seeing, um, we have selective perception. You know, our brain is designed to, you know, notice motion, light, novelty, and things that tend to be right in front of us. Um, so that's what our attention is going to be drawn toward. Uh, the trick is teaching us ourselves some techniques for looking both broadly and deeply on a regular basis. So we're picking up more than what is going to be naturally attending uh, or naturally going to draw our eye. Um, so those are some of the strategies in seeing. Even if you see the exposures in front of you, um, then the next piece is how do you interpret those exposures appropriately so that you can take action and, and protect yourself? Um, and that's where thinking comes in. And you know we've got a number of cognitive biases that impact our ability to do the job effectively. Um, we tend to think nothing bad is going to happen to us. We tend to be overconfident in our abilities, and et cetera. Um, so understanding what those biases are and then putting in place the strategies for how you pause and how you question the steps that you're taking increases the chances, uh, particularly when there's change in occurring, increases the chances that you'll be able to mitigate those, um, those biases. And the last piece is doing. How do you, once you're doing the task from step one to step 10, doing those in a way, removing the distractions, rechecking the work, um, and putting in place those strategies to minimize uh, all of the other factors we talked about, memory, uh, distractions, divided attention, fatigue, et cetera. Um, and then as we mentioned, you know, so that's with you working by yourself, seeing, thinking, and doing, but just adding a second person to the team doesn't necessarily improve your seeing, thinking, and doing. There are some team skills and capabilities that need to be added so that um, we can bolster our seeing, thinking, and, and doing um, by having a team that is uh, unafraid to communicate with each other, unafraid to say things that may be against the group consensus, and and uh, willingly and uh, appropriately sharing mental models and sharing their assumptions. And when you've got all four of those things working, again, you've you've put in place another significant layer of protection um, that helps drive human performance reliability. Um, so I. I know we're a little bit out of time. Uh, Mark, if there are additional questions, I think Dave and I have some time to uh, continue to stay on the line. Um, yeah, and yeah we, have, we, have, we do. We have about one or two more questions. But uh, before I ask those, um, for those who need to jump off right now, I will let them know that uh, this webinar was recorded and we'll send the link to you next week, plus the slide deck that we used in this presentation. And also in that email, we'll provide a downloadable link to the white paper that uh, David and Mike have written that complements this webinar. So, um, so in overtime here, um, we have a question from Roger Vance, and he asks, it sounds like you're presenting this from the aspect of proactive and asking us from an investigative aspect. Do you suggest this as more as a task work analysis or more from the aspect of understanding why things went wrong? I, I think from, uh, go ahead, David. No, you go ahead. From, uh, from the scenario standpoint, it was really to kind of see these in action um, and, and get a sense of how these brain-centered hazards play a role in a day-to-day -day, uh, work environment. Um, and then what you can do to try to proactively get in front of that. That being said, and that's what the making safe decisions approach is all about. But that being said, the um, uh, understanding the impact that these hazards have uh, can have a significant approach or a significant impact on how you conduct investigations of of incidents when they do occur, and understanding more around what are the things that are driving. Uh, choices that are made that are driving steps that are taken, and when you when you understand it from this this perspective, it becomes um, easier to take those investigations and make them more into learning events where you're understanding what's likely to make how how do we make this 
job that this person doing more fail safe so that the so the next person coming down the line is less likely to to fall into the same trap that this person flew in so it you know i think when you apply this to an investigation it becomes a more um, uh, caring approach it becomes a more humane approach but it also gets you to more systemic uh fixes to um to those issues David? I think it's and just just a, one one more comment on the um, the event learning as well that you brought up, Mike. The uh, we get a lot of requests to sort of help better instill um, kind of lines of inquiry with regards to human performance into kind of traditional um, investigation processes. It's no secret that sort of worldwide a lot of businesses are moving away from the whole concept of uh, and the language of investigation and moving towards. And we, it really is an event learning. We, we really want to learn. Nobody wants to be investigated, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, what would it look like um, to take kind of a different approach to this? And also to go beyond just knowing that, you know, tick the boxes, um, you know, potentially in, in, in a software program that indicates, yeah, fatigue was a factor, distraction was a factor. Okay, but what led to that? Why was the person distracted? What led to them being fatigued? Um, often that's missing. And so, um, a good idea for businesses to drill down a bit further to get the full story um, and, and, and truly be able to learn from events. Okay, and we have one more question from Benjamin Martin. He's asking, can we get a little more elaboration on teaming? For example, what is it, how is it, uh, for, for example, what is it and how is it different from teamwork? Uh, excellent question, Benjamin. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, you know, from <laughs> I think from the 1980s, we're, there's been team building types of exercises. There have been uh, teamwork initiatives and things like that. So, uh, you know, the idea that we should team is not the, not a new idea under the sun. Um, the, what, the approach we're taking is from um, really from the from the brain perspective on what's happening. That why why do we have such a desire to go along, get along within the group, um, and and how do we best mitigate that? How do we so that the team can function more effectively? So uh, we're in our teaming workshop. We pull in uh, certainly the brain science, but then we also pull in uh, some of the, the techniques and strategies that have been used to great effect in a number of uh, scenarios that have have had. A, um, great improvements in, for example, the airline industry, um, where for the last several decades, they've really worked on how does that crew communicate with each other, and uh, particularly when you've got a very senior pilot and a much more junior co-pilot, when something's going wrong with what the pilot is doing, does that co-pilot, and how does that co-pilot engage with that pilot so that they can in the, they can keep the, the plane flying safely. Um, so those are well proven strategies and techniques um, that wove into how you can get a team to engage with each other, uh, to communicate and to, and to make sure that our desire to get along with the team does not become a barrier um, to safety performance. Hope that helps. Yeah. Um, and so finally, I just have a comment. Um, it's not a question, but in wrapping things up, this is from Lynn Carroll. And she's saying, we all generally work in high pressure jobs. So this information is very useful to strengthen our resilience programs and helping people understand challenges and learning defense mechanisms helps us on a number of levels. Thank you. I agree. Uh, Great. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. And again, uh, thanks uh, David and Mike for your insight. This webinar was recorded. And so next week you'll get a link uh, to the webinar recording, the slide deck we use in the presentation, plus another link to the white paper that David and Mike uh, wrote that complements this webinar. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome.